Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve a problem, regions cut by slashes. Another fantastic problem to solve. It's actually a pretty interesting one. The idea is we're actually given an array of strings where it's gonna form an n by n grid. I don't know why they couldn't have given us like an array of characters, a grid of characters, but oh well. This one, for example, would look like this. I'll draw it out because it's easier to visualize than these uh, strings. So imagine we have this two by two grid. There could be empty spaces or there could be backslashes or forward slashes. I think that's a forward slash. I might have them mixed up, but anyways. So this one in particular, you can see has a forward slash here and here. So now if you were to count the number of regions that we have, like this is a boundary and this is a boundary, clearly we have one region over here and a second region over there. So immediately, if you don't even look at the other examples in your mind, you might think to count these regions sounds similar to like number of islands or one of those core problems in the neat code 150 list. If you've gone through that list. While it would work in this example, this first one, we would run a DFS from every empty position, marking them as visited. So we'd mark this one as visited. And we can't really visit this one because it's divided. So we kind of just ignore those. Maybe we consider them as like blocked positions. And then we'd count another one over here. So that's two. So the goal of this problem is to count the number of regions that we have. And in this first example, it works. We get two. But it's not going to always work. It would probably work in this case, I guess. So, you know, this is blocked out and then we'd get this region counted with a DFS. You could also use BFS. These are just core graph algorithms that I cover very deeply, I think, on Neatcode.io. A bunch of animations and all that. Actually, I think this would be a good time to kind of show those animations just in case you don't know how those algorithms work. So I'll play this one at 2x speed just to kind of go through it. This is kind of a similar grid where let's say the ones are marked off and zeros are not marked. So DFS is just going to kind of go as far deep as we can in any particular direction. And this one is looking for a path. We're not obviously doing that in this problem, but the core idea is the same. You can check these out on like Nikodio on the matrix DFS and uh, BFS. I have another one for that here as well. Going to the third example, it's not going to work because look at the grid that we have. We have something that looks like this, where we have a slash there, a slash there, here, and here. Now, technically counting these, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, and then in the middle, we have the fifth one. But our DFS isn't gonna work because we consider these ones as like blocked off. So how do we do it? Well, the first thing you might think is, well, just because we have a slash here doesn't mean that this is blocked off. Maybe we can split this up into multiple cells. Like say, okay, this is one, this is the region that's blocked off, and then this is two, these are open. It's kind of complicated to do that, like doing just two cells wouldn't work because you have obviously two empty regions and then one like line. Doing three regions is strange because we can't get enough information from that. You could say that these are open and then the middle is blocked here, but the one below it would kind of be the same thing. And obviously these two are not equal right? This is a slash going in a different direction. The other thing you might think is, well, this is a square. So if we want to make it bigger, we should create another square, maybe a two by two square for every single one of these. And honestly, it's not a bad idea. At least that's what I think, because that's what I was able to come up with. And unfortunately, it didn't work. Let me show you why it doesn't work. So scaling this example, we'll have a two by two square for each of these. So let's say we have four two by two squares. Let's draw the line here. Let's draw the other one going there, this one and this one. In this example, it actually does work. That's why it's misleading. You run a DFS over here. Okay, you get this one and then you run a DFS from here. You'll get this, this one, this one and this one. And then you run the DFS there, there and there. And so I think you would correctly count five here. So this is a DFS going in four directions, but it's going to fail for some examples. Let me show you. Suppose after scaling, we end up with something that looks like this. 
So this square had one slash, this one had a slash, this one had a slash, and this one had a slash. So you can just imagine that the input would have been literally this, like two slashes in the first string and then two slashes in the second string. And then after scaling, this is what it would look like. So you might see the problem here. Run a DFS over here, that's one region. I mean, in total, we clearly have one, two, three, four regions. So run the DFS here, you get it, great. Run the DFS uh, maybe from here. Okay, well, the DFS is only gonna mark this. Remember, our DFS goes in four directions, left, down, right, up. So it's only going to get that. That'll count one. Then run the DFS over here eventually, because we're only running DFS from the squares that don't have a slash. Run the DFS here, then here, that's three, that's four, that's five, that's six, that's seven. So clearly we miscounted them. Okay, now your approach might be the brilliant idea that I had. Why not let ourselves go diagonally? Isn't that such a smart idea? Well, unfortunately, it's not. Can you look at the picture and tell me what would happen? If you can, you're smarter than me. Yes, going from here, allowing ourselves to go diagonally, here would count these as well. But do you see it would also count the ones going top right? Well, that's not a problem. Going top left, well, that's not a problem. Well, going bottom right, that might be a problem. We're not allowed to go through the line. And how would we possibly know that we went through a line? Doing it this way isn't going to work. So basically, long story short, we can't just scale this up to two by two. We need more space here. So instead, let's scale it to three by three. So each character in the input is going to be its own three by three grid. So let's see how that would work with this example. Remember, this is what the input would be. So we'll get a three by three square for each of them. This might not be the cleanest. So now we can put the diagonal here, the diagonal here, here, and here as well. So now let's try it. Okay, run the DFS from here. We'll count that, that, and that. That's one region. So then we'd probably run the DFS from here and then get that, 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 and that and all these as well actually so that's the second region and then eventually like we wouldn't redo any of these because they're already visited and eventually we'd get here and then get the third region i'll kind of go fast now because you get the idea and then eventually we'd go down here this is the fourth region so three by three is enough we won't run into any sort of issues at this point the problem just becomes take the input scale it to three by three grids for every single character if we have an empty character then it's just going to be an empty three by three grid if we have have a forward slash then it's going to look like this if we have a backslash then it's going to look opposite so it would look something like this going in the other direction and then once you have that grid that's three times the size as the input you just run dfs it's pretty much just number of islands at that point just count the connected regions that you know don't go through any of the lines so the last thing you might wonder is, well, how exactly do you scale it? Well, we know obviously the size of the grid is gonna be three times the size of the input. That's not hard to initialize. But when we get to a one by one grid, for example, so for a second, just kind of assume that this stuff isn't here. Well, I guess I can just kind of clean it up. Imagine this was our input. And this would have been in the form of a string. So like here, given these input strings, we'd have a one by one grid that looks like this. Imagine we wanted to put that over here. Well, we'd see that, okay, the first character is empty, so the first three by three grid should be empty. The next character is a forward slash, so we need to put a slash there. So what do we do? Well, we're going to start at the row, and we're going to get all three of these rows. And we're going to start at the top right, put like an X there, or just block it out, and then block this one out, and then block this one out as well. It doesn't really matter how you block them out, actually. So if we were going like this, or we had a slash that went in the other direction, it doesn't really matter. As long as you have a way to indicate the free spaces versus the blocked out spaces, you can use zero and one. So that's what I'm going to be sticking with. Let's say zero is empty and ones are blocked. There's that, but now let's actually look at the indices for this. So this was zero, one, two, three, four, five. This is zero, one, two, and continuing. Over here, we have zero, one, and then zero, one. Now the pattern is gonna be when we see one over here, this is gonna correspond to this quadrant, like this three by three square. How do we know that though? Well, we just take the row and multiply it by three. That's going to tell us the starting position. If you took this and multiplied it by three, you'd get zero. And then you'd say the next three belong to this guy. Same thing over here. You take this, multiply it by three, then these next three belong to this guy. If you took the next one, which would be two, multiply it by three, you'd start at six. That is clearly a pattern that works. 
And it would obviously apply the same way from the columns as well, because the math is going to be the exact same. It's still three by three. So that's pretty much it. That will tell us the starting row and the starting column. This will kind of be the top left. If we were doing a slash like this, we'd take that and add one to it to both the column and the row to get this one and then add one to it again to get this. In the opposite case, we'd be here, but we would want to start there. So we'd probably add two to the row and then just go in the other direction. I think that'll just make more sense in the code. The overall time complexity is just going to be three times the dimensions of the input grid. Since it's a square grid, it's going to be n squared. So three times that is still going to be big O of n squared. We're obviously declaring extra memory for this. So the space complexity is going to be the same. Let's code this up. So I started with a little bit of boilerplate. We just get the dimensions of the input grid. I call that rows one and columns one. We multiply each of those by three to get the dimensions of the second grid, which we're going to declare down here. So it's going to be each row is going to have this many columns and we're going to have this many rows. So this is just a two dimensional grid of all zeros initially. So next we can have a couple nested loops to go over the input grid and then map it to the second grid. So something like this. Now, there's only two cases, because remember, the third case is where the grid is empty at that position, and we don't really care about that. So we can check that either this is a backslash, or I think that's a forward slash, honestly, I'm not sure, or that it's a slash that goes in the other direction, like this. And the reason we have two characters here is because by itself, this is like the escape character. So like, for example, like, see, we have like double quotes around this. What if I wanted to type something like, hello, like I wanted to use the quote characters inside of that string? Well, that's what the slash is for. Like this would print the string hello with quotes around it. So the escape character is used for that. So we need double of these to say that we actually want the character itself. Anyways, now we do the scaling. Before we even start that, let's get the top left of the current three by three portion that we're trying to get, which we can just take row and multiply it by three. Same thing with column. And I'll assign these to a couple variables. I'm not creative, so I'm just going to do row two and column two. This tells us the top left. So let's start with this one because it's actually going to be simpler. Top left is R2 and column two, and we just want to put a slash through it. So this is going to be one. And then we're going to copy this, add one to both of these to get the middle spot and set that to one as well. And then copy this and then add two to each of these to get the bottom right spot in that three by three square. So now let's do the other side. I'm just going to copy this so we don't have to type it all out. So this we want to be the top right. So row stays the same, but column is going to be plus two. This we want to be the middle. It already is. So that's fine. This we want to be the bottom left row plus two is good. Column, though, should stay the same. So so there we go. We're going to use a DFS and I'm not going to implement it just quite yet. I'm going to show you how to use it first. We're going to count the number of regions and then we're going to return that. So let's do that by going over every position in the second grid. So do rows two here. Make sure you have that correct. And for every column in the second grid, columns two, and then we want to run DFS on it. So row, column, and we don't want to visit the same position twice. So let's have a hash set, which I'm going to call visit. I'll zoom out a bit. I call it visit and that's what we're gonna pass in here. Now there's no need for us to run DFS here if this position is already visited or if it's a like slash character or rather in our case a one because that is blocked off. So let's have an if statement here. If the grid at this position, well grid two, make sure you have that correct. If grid two at this position is equal to zero and this coordinate has not been visited, it's not in visit, then run DFS. So we found a new region that hasn't been visited. So we can also increment the result by one here. So this is all of the code. The DFS is actually going to be shorter than you think. The main thing is definitely the base case. So if we ever go out of bounds, if row is less than zero or column is less than zero, or we reach the edge, row is equal to number of rows or column is equal to the number of columns. Or of course we reach a position that's not zero. That means it's blocked off. So grid two, make sure you have grid two there, is a not equal to zero or it's equal to one. Or this position is visited. Row column is in visit. Then we would immediately return. We don't need to keep going. That's also remember to add the parameters here to the DFS. So row, column, and visit. So if this is not the case, then we want to do our DFS. So at this point, we can mark this coordinate as visited. And we can go through the neighbors of the current row. How do we get the neighbors? Well, the easiest way to do it is just to create an array. 
So we know that we only care about the neighbors in the four adjacent directions. So we can take row column, copy and paste it a few times like this, and then add one to each of these. So add one to row, add one to column, uh, subtract one from row, and then subtract one from column. So that gives you the four directions. Now we want to go through those four neighbors. We can do that like this for neighbor row, neighbor column in a neighbor. So this is using unpacking. We're getting both of the coordinates at the same time because we have an array of pairs. I cover this in my Python for coding interviews course if you are interested in learning about that. But we have the coordinates. So now we can just do the DFS on the neighbor row, neighbor column, passing in the visit hash set. So I believe that is correct. I really hope we don't have a bug because coding all this up, even though it's only, I guess, 30 six lines of code, it was still kind of a pain. So let's make sure that it's correct. And of course, I mentioned it multiple times, but I still made the mistake. Uh, I used grid one here. We're trying to map grid one to grid two. So I got to replace these with grid two. So I'm going to quickly do that to all of these. I'm really sorry about that. Whoops. But now I believe it should work. And once again, I had a typo in the name. So this should be rows two and this should be columns two. I guess that's a reason to have more descriptive names, so I apologize for that. Okay, now it works. And while the runtime doesn't seem efficient, this is pretty much as efficient of a solution that you can get. I mean, if you can think of some more optimizations, feel free to let me know. But if you found this helpful, check out neatcode.io for a lot more. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.